This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Chris has uh, worked hard to try and get everybody involved, and I know that you're just waking up, but it is kind of hard to make anatomy and physiology participatory, and it is easy to put people to sleep, so I'm going to try and do anatomy and physiology a little bit light, I hope, so that you don't go right back to sleep. These are my disclosures. So there is nothing new about the fact that the tear still occurs in the same place. Um, what is new or what has been evolving over the past decade or so is the knowledge of the molecular and cellular level changes that occur that allow the dissection to take place in the first place and then to propagate or extend uh, into the chronic phase. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that. There are some lovely summary articles and I'll have some references at the bottom of the slides as we go along. But the original concept of sort of cystic medial degeneration is really far too broad and uninformative. And most people would consider that virtually every element of the media of the aortic wall is abnormal to some degree in patients who have dissections. And because for most of us, it's the type B dissections that we have to deal with and figure out how to prevent from becoming type A's and that we are primarily involved with, I tried to, to focus in this talk on what we know about type B's with regard to anatomy and physiology and try to stay a little bit away from the type A's, although you'll see that's not completely possible. So in, in dissections, there's smooth muscle cell loss, there's fragmentation and loss of elastic fibers, and accumulation of abnormal proteins or abnormal normal amounts of proteins in the areas of the aortic wall with cellular depletion. The resultant progression undoubtedly reflects an interplay of a number of different factors, including the hemodynamic stress, aortic injury, chronic inflammation, some degree of genetic propensity, and then epidemiologic risk factors. And exactly what the balance is of that is among the things that people have spent a great deal of time trying to work out. You'll recall from all your old anatomy books that the media consists of elastic fibers and vascular smooth muscle cells interconnected by collagen and a bunch of proteins and the various adhesive proteins. And when functioning, all of those elements confer a degree of elasticity and tensile strength. Sequester growth factors, which is something you probably don't think of a structure as doing, and then form structural interactions that create a normal, healthy aortic wall. But in dissection, virtually all the elements of the aortic wall of the aortic media show abnormalities, and abnormalities in all of their multiple components. For the elastin, it's the fibers, the microfibrils, all of their associated proteins, and the interface proteins. Collagen is not only abnormal in type, but in deposition, and it's disordered. You might think that there's less uh, collagen deposition. Actually, there's more, possibly creating a stiffened aorta that is more prone to dissection and more prone to extension of the dissection. Smooth muscle cells die off, uh, resulting from an imbalance between pro-apoptotic factors and anti-apoptotic factors. And the phenotype changes from contractile to synthetic, which is not the normal state for the aortic wall. And then, as we mentioned, the proteoglycans and the glycosaminoglycans all are, or not all, but are commonly increased and deposited in areas where the dissection is most likely to start, which is kind of intriguing that those points where the tear is commonly located is also the, the place where these abnormal proteins tend to increase in concentration more commonly. Increasing the concentration of these abnormal proteins in the layers of the aortic wall is a little bit like uh, trickling water between two cement slabs. After a while, the cement slab starts to move, and that's exactly what happens with the aorta. 
In addition, all the usual inflammatory markers are there and implicated in the process. There's evidence of hypoxia and increased tissue oxidative stress and excess of proteases, and you're all familiar with the role of the MMPs in this process, and abnormal pathologic signaling, of, two, of which the two most prominent pathways are the TGF-beta pathway and the angiotensin II pathway. So that's about as much of the cellular level anatomy as you can probably tolerate before the, the caffeine begins to wear off a little bit. So in terms of the distribution of dissections, type Bs are still relatively infrequent in comparison to type As. There has not been a shift in that. It still accounts for approximately a third, quarter to a third of all the dissections. What people have begun to pay a bit more attention to, although you can tell by the age of these references that it hasn't really taken the literature by storm, is the fact that not every dissection is the same as every other dissection and that there is a continuum of the pathology in the aortic wall, all the way from minor dissections with no subintimal or hem uh, intramural hematoma to the classic true and false lumen dissection. And it should be fairly obvious that all of these different morphologies will likely behave differently. So if you're trying to establish what the treatment should be, it really makes sense that the um, patients and the, the, the subject group should be better defined than just simply by A and B, that one should also look at the degree of the um, the, the proportion of the pathology represented by the study group that you're working on because the natural history and the appropriate intervention are likely going to be different for all of these groups. And yet, it's only within the last few years that people have begun to focus on that more than attempting to, to sort of treat all dissections as the same. I'm going to talk a little bit about some pro potentially prognostic factors once the dissection has occurred, but I'm not going to go into it in great detail because Dr. Hiramoto is going to be talking about this in the next talk, uh, trying to figure out when it's appropriate to treat type B dissections by looking at things with prognostic fact, um, potential roles. But people have begun to look at the location and the morphology of the tear in the aorta. Now, sometimes they refer to tears when I think what they're actually meaning is fenestrations. But for the primary tear, it's possible that the location on the inner or outer curve has some role in the, the likelihood of continued antegrade or retrograde dissection and the likelihood of later enlargement of the false lumen. Of interest, when the, curve, when the inner curve is the site of the major tear, there's a relatively small group of patients who have no arch or ascending aortic involvement. The size and number of tears and fenestrations is felt to have a role which sort of intuitively makes sense. The more equal the pressures are in the true and false lumens, the, the, different, uh, the greater difference in how the true and false lumens may um, evolve over time. But I have to say, you're probably sitting there thinking, how the heck do they measure those things? And I think that's a very important question because anybody looking at a CT scan of a dissection or any other imaging is impressed by how complex the, more, the anatomy is. So trying to measure and establish the morphology of these tears, I think, is something you really have to take with a grain of salt. And it, uh, some of the information that attempts to correlate tears with prognosis is based on modeling. Now, it's modeling of actual aortas, but nonetheless, it's not really established by natural history. So be a little cautious as to whether that's really something you can rely upon. You're familiar with the fact that the, the aortic diameter has an impact on the likelihood of later enlargement, both the overall aortic diameter as well as the false lumen diameter, as well as certain specific anatomic locations of the aorta that seem to have more prognostic capacity or implications than other areas. And then there has been some recognition that the shape of the lumen as well as the flow in the true and false lumens may correlate with subsequent risk a further extension of dissection or enlargement, uh, aneurysmal enlargement. Um, to, gr to a great degree, these uh, morphologic features are a reflection of the balance of the pressure in the true and the false lumens. That's sort of the key factor in what will ultimately happen. And all of these things are just ways to try to assess that in a simple manner using things that we do all the time to follow these patients, which is image them with CT scans.
you're certainly familiar with the importance of controlling blood pressure, again, to control the pressure in the false lumen, and with the negative correlation of high blood pressure with continued risk of enlargement of an aneurysmal degeneration, you may not be as aware of the fact that the, the tight control of heart rate is also quite important in preventing further degeneration and further both aortic events and events that require surgical intervention. I want to comment just a little bit on the concept of static and dynamic obstruction, which has become more emphasized over the past uh, in intervals of time. You know, we all had this fantasy that if you can just collapse the septum and obliterate the false lumen, all you have to do is cover the entry tear and everything will be peachy. Well, it turns out that's rarely the case, at least in the patients that we see, it seems not to be the case. The, um, what you have to do is equalize the pressures in the lumens in order to eliminate the possibility of dynamic obstruction. Dynamic obstruction, however, is potentially eas more easily treated than static obstruction where there's a fixed um, impediment to flow in the branch and requires some direct action on the branch most of the time in order to restore flow. But the concept that there are different mechanisms of impeding flow into the downstream uh, tissue beds is something that took a little while to evolve, but clearly relates to the, uh, again, the hemodynamics of the true and the false lumens. So now, to wake you up a little bit more, this will be your first little quiz for the day, because I want to talk a little bit about genetics, but no, I'm not going to show any of those extensive little diagrams of families. So. Let's pretend that you have a 50-year-old man with a type B dissection. He had antecedent mild one-drug hypertension, no abnormal, you know, funny-looking body parts anywhere. A cousin who had an aortic aneurysm, not a dissection. So this patient probably has, get your little clickers ready, hypertension-related sporadic thoracic dissection, some form of Marfan's, some other genetic abnormality, or just bad luck. Of course, he may have bad luck if he has any of the A, B, and C either. So I suppose you can answer bad luck for any part of this. All right, so hypertension-related spread, and that's actually probably the most correct of all these answers, though in fact any of the three answers, including, I guess, bad luck, are correct. The least correct is probably some form of Marfan's, which everybody, uh, <laughs> I like the idea that 14% thought he had bad luck. So um, well, he does have bad luck. So the, now, when in moving into talking about genetics, I move a little bit away from trying to focus on just the type Bs because much more is known about the genetic abnormalities associated with the syndromic dissections. So if there's syndromic, there's obviously non-syndromic, and then there's isolated. And we'll get to those in just a second. Most of the syndromic um, abnormalities are related to genet have genetic underlying defects, which you can see summarized there. And everybody knows about the fibrillin gene and Marfan's and the collagen gene uh, defects in Ehlers-Danlos and a variety of other genetic defects in these other forms of syndromic uh, type A, type B, and type A dissections. But as I just mentioned, for the most part in the syndromic uh, abnormalities, the involved segment of the aorta is the ascending aorta or the aortic root or both. And really only in this group, Ehlers-Danlos has a, a fairly high incidence of involvement of the abdominal and thoracic aorta. But if you look at the non-syndromic, which is what you would call that, our little mythical patient on that slide, the non-syndromic, which means they don't have anything that you look at them and say, well, you know, they've got lens abnormalities, they're tall and skinny, and their joints are funny, and, you know, funny uvulas. Um, those, these are the patients that are in the category of non-syndromic, but there is a family history often, and quite relatively commonly, a genetic abnormality. And these are the various genetic abnormalities that have been identified in patients who do not have any obvious uh, other evidence besides their aortic pathology. What's interesting about these, this group is, and I guess I'll just move forward for a little bit, um, as I said, about at least 20% of patients in this category may have a genetic component, but because there is variation in penetrance and severity, you can't count on something to tip you off to the fact that the patient has an underlying aortic anomaly. As a consequence, 
about 50% of the patients with the most common genetic variation that is non-syndromic, which is this ACTA2, it's an alpha-2 actin gene deficiency, will present with thoracic dissection, and about 25% are fatal. Interestingly, this is different than patients with Marfan's in whom the presentation of dissection has been going down. Why? Because everybody looks at them, knows they're funny looking, and then they probably have an aortic problem and they get imaged. So they're diagnosed with an aneurysmally enlarged aorta, whereas these patients have no clue and nobody else has a clue, so they're diagnosed when they present with dissection. And I've just listed the relative percentages. They're still not the most frequent uh, form, as you all honed in on with the little quiz, the most frequent form is just the isolated dissection. But it's frequent enough that you need to think about it, and particularly if there's a relative who has an aneurysm of any type. So these are just a few other the genetic abnormalities. Um, what I wanted to point out is the frequency with which TGF-beta abnormality, and particularly TGF-beta signaling, is at the root cause of these abnormalities. Um, this is probably the target of most investigations now is looking at abnormal TGF-beta signaling as a way of trying to, uh, cor to sort of integrate the pathologies that we see with dissections. And this is a nice little summary in this article about how to approach patients based upon their presentation and the presence or absence of a family history and then putting them into the syndromal or the non-syndromal categories. Just very quickly, there's a summary of, in the circulation a few years ago providing levels of evidence of how you should approach the treatment of thoracic aortic disease. And I just put this slide here, not so you know all the terms, but remember green, yellow, and red, or orange, as a level of uh, quality of the data. And if you look for recommendations as to how to screen or approach the patient and family members, who appear to have a genetic abnormality, they have summarized it very nicely in that article. The level of data is not the strongest, but there are reasonably good recommendations for who should be imaged, who should have genetic counseling, and who should just be monitored over time. So I guess I'll stop there so I don't, we don't get too late from the very beginning, and thank you very much. <laughs>